All right, so hi everybody, welcome back. Today we're going to be finishing up our chapter 11 lecture on angular momentum. And where we left off last time was the discussion of conservation of angular momentum. So the idea is if you have a system with no external torques acting on it, then the total angular momentum of that system is going to be conserved. It's going to stay the same. So how about we start off with another example of that. Here we have a disc with a mass of 125 grams and a radius of 7.2 centimeters, which is fixed to a frictionless axle with negligible mass. The disc spins with an angular speed of 0.6 revolutions per second. So that's the disc here that's spinning initially at 0.6 revolutions per second. Then we have two identical discs, which are initially not rotating, dropped onto the first disc. So these two discs, which are the same size, the same mass as the first disc, they're not rotating initially, they're dropped onto the first disc like this. Okay, so initially what's gonna happen is the discs are going to grind against each other for a while, but if you wait long enough, they're all going to be rotating at the same rate. So the final state is all three discs are rotating together at the same exact rate. The question is, what is that final angular speed of the three disks? Let's work this out. Okay, so we'll start by specifying what the system is. The system for this solution will be the three disks. And let's actually number them uh, so we can keep track of which one we're talking about. Let's say disk number one is the one on top, number two is the one in the middle, and then three is the one on the bottom, which is initially spinning. Now, when we consider this system, we'll notice that there are no external torques acting on the system, which means the total angular momentum is conserved. So we can make an equation out of that. L initial, that would be the total angular momentum of the three disks in the initial state is equal to L final, which would be the total angular momentum of the three disks in the final state. Now, just so we can sort of keep track of what direction the angular momentum is going in, let's say that the z-axis is pointing up like so. And if we take a look at the initial picture, if you use the right-hand rule, you curl your fingers in the direction that the, the uh, disc number three is rotating in. You're going to find that your thumb is pointing up. So the angular momentum is in the positive Z direction. And let's write down a formula for L initial. So disc number one, it's not rotating. So the initial angular momentum of disc number one is zero. Same for disc number two, it's not rotating initially. But disc number three is. And the way we write its angular momentum is gonna be I times omega. So let's say I3, the moment of iner uh, inertia for disc number three, times omega initial. Let's write it that way. And then K hat to indicate that we're going in the positive Z direction. Okay, so that's equal to L final. So now all three disks are rotating at the same speed. So we have disk number one with moment of inertia I1 rotating at angular speed omega final. And again, this is gonna be in the Z direction. Then we have disk number two, moment of inertia is I2 uh, rotating at speed omega final, same uh, omega final is for disk number one. And then again for disk number three, we have I3 times omega final in the Z direction like this. Okay, so this can be simplified a lot because the disks are identical. So we don't even need to come up with the formula for the moment of inertia. All we need to know is actually that I1 is the same as I2 is the same as I3. Uh, and so let's just call that I. We don't really need to give it a specific label. So on the left side of the equation, 
we have just i times omega initial. On the right side, we have three times i times omega final. The k hat unit vector, of course, cancels out. So omega final, therefore, is going to be canceling out the i's one third of omega initial. The idea here is we've essentially tripled the moment of inertia. So the angular speed is going to have to be decreased by a factor of three. That's what this is saying. So we just have one third of omega initial, which is 0.6 revolutions per second or 0 0.2 revolutions per second. Okay. So here's a follow up to that one. In the previous example, we were able to apply conservation of angular momentum to the system of three disks because there were no external torques acting on the system. Now, were there any internal torques acting within the system in this example? In other words, were there any torques between the disks in the system in that previous example? And then as a follow up to that, how fast would the two disks initially have to be rotating so that everything stops rotating after they are dropped onto the first disk? So in other words, imagine that these two that we drop onto the first disk are not stationary, they're actually rotating to start off. How fast would they have to be rotating in order to bring everything to a stop in the final state? So pause the video, try to work this out, see if you can get the answer and then we'll go through it together. Okay, so to answer the first question, are there any internal torques acting on our system here? That would mean torques between uh, disks in the system. The answer is yes, there are internal torques. That would be the torques due to friction between the disks as they grind against each other. Now let's think about that. So we have disc one and disc two being dropped onto disc number three. And at the end of all this, discs one, two, and three are rotating at the same rate. So something has to happen in order to get everything spinning at the same rate at the end of all this. And what that's gonna take is friction, okay? If we drop disc one and two onto disc three and there's no friction, well, discs one and two are never going to start rotating in the first place, and you're never gonna get everything rotating at the same rate at the end of all this. So again, you need that internal torque due to friction to uh, get that to happen. Now, keep in mind, this is an internal torque, not an outside, not an external torque. So angular momentum is still conserved regardless. Okay, as a follow-up then, uh, we want to look at the situation where disk 1 and 2 are initially rotating. And then in the final state, everything comes to a stop. Okay, so the question would be, how fast would disk one and two need to be rotating in order for that to happen? So what we're gonna be using here is conservation of angular momentum, L initial is equal to L final, just like before. And so, for L initial, we're going to have to break this up into parts. Um, I'm going to have the moment of inertia of disk number one times the initial angular speed of disks one and two. So one and two are initially spinning at the same rate here. So that's the same omega for one and two. And then we add to that the moment of inertia of disk two times the initial angular speed of disks one and two. Again, that's the same thing. And then plus the moment of inertia of disk number three times the initial angular speed of disk number three. So here, this is omega three right here. 
we have some different omega for disks one and two up here. Now, in the final state, uh, everything is at rest, so there's actually no angular momentum in the final state. This is zero for L final. Okay, and then just like before, we're gonna remember that I1 is the same as I2, is the same as I3, so we can actually divide that out. And then we get two times omega one, two is equal to minus omega three. So omega one, two is equal to minus a half times omega three. So we get minus one half times 0.6 revolutions per second, which gives us minus 0.3 revolutions per second. Okay, so what this is saying is that disks one and two must be rotating in the opposite direction um, as disk number three in order for this to all work out. So in other words, you see how disk number three is rotating this way? Disks one and two must be rotating the opposite way uh, in order for at the end, everything to come to a stop. Here, we're gonna have 0.3 revolutions per second. And then here, we're gonna have 0.6 revolutions per second as given. That's the idea. Okay, so, one common situation where it's useful to use this idea of conservation of angular momentum is when you have an object with a changing moment of inertia. So now let's think about just a single object where there is no outside torque acting on that object. So we know that the angular momentum will be conserved in that situation. So any kind of change in the moment of inertia is gonna to have to lead to a change in the speed of the object's rotation. The idea is, if L initial is equal to L final, initial angular momentum is equal to final angular momentum. And we also know that for a solid object, we can express the angular momentum as I times omega. This equation then says, I initial times omega initial is equal to I final times omega final. So how can you change the moment of inertia of an object? Well, basically the idea is if an object's mass is brought in closer to the axis of rotation, then I is going to decrease. And in turn, omega is gonna to have to increase so that the product of I times omega stays the same. On the other hand, if the mass moves further out from the axis of rotation, then I is going to increase and then omega is gonna to have to decrease in turn, again, to keep the product of I times omega the same. And this is something that uh, athletes do all the time, particularly in gymnastics or diving or figure skating. Um, the example on the, on the left is shown here, where the figure skater has her arms far out from her body. So she increases her moment of inertia by putting the mass of her arms further out from the axis of rotation. But then if she brings her arms closer in, she decreases her moment of inertia, and that's going to make her spin faster than before. Or let's say this gymnast over here is performing a flip. So uh, she jumps into the air, and then immediately she tucks her arms and legs in as close as possible to her body. Again, that decreases her moment of inertia, so she spins faster. But then when she wants to land the flip, she'll spread her arms and legs out further from the axis of rotation, and that will slow her down so that she can actually uh, land safely. So again, this is something that happens all the time in different sports. So let's take that idea and apply it to this example here. A typical star rotates on its axis about once every month. When a star uses up its fuel, it will collapse in on itself. For stars with masses of about 10 to 30 times the mass of the sun, the result of this collapse will be a neutron star. 
So suppose we have a star with a mass of about 10 to the 31 kilograms and a radius of about 10 to the 6 meters. And this star collapses and becomes a neutron star, which has a radius of about 20 kilometers. Let's estimate the final rotation speed of that neutron star in units of revolutions per second. So we're going to assume that the mass remains the same throughout the collapse. So the idea here is you have a star, which is a gigantic object spinning on its axis initially. Then that star collapses in on itself. So now all of that mass is compressed to a much, much smaller size, but it's still spinning on its axis. So much like the figure skater who brings her arms closer in, um, the moment of inertia decreases when the star collapses in on itself, and therefore it's going to spin faster once it becomes uh, a neutron star. So we're going to figure out how fast it's spinning at the end of that process. In order to do the calculation, we're going to need to know this formula for the moment of inertia of a solid sphere rotating about its center of mass, and that's given by 2 fifths mr squared. So we're going to use that uh, formula in our calculation. All right, so let's get into it. Okay, so for this problem, the system is going to be the rotating star. And since we have no external torques acting on the star, the total angular momentum is going to be the same throughout this collapse. So it's conserved, in other words. Okay, so we have for the system, L initial is equal to L final, which as we saw earlier, we can express as I initial times omega initial equals I final times omega final because we're basically just dealing with one object whose moment of inertia is changing. So in that case, we can use this form. And remember that the relevant uh, formula for I is 2 fifths times mR squared. So what we'll have is for I initial, we're going to have 2 fifths times the mass of the star times R initial squared times omega initial equaling 2 fifths times the mass of the star times R final. It's the radius that's changing here. Uh, times omega final like this. So the two-fifths factor cancels, so does the mass. And we're left with omega final is equal to r initial over r final squared times omega initial. And we know both r initial and r final. Um, r initial is the radius of the original star, which is about 10 to the 6 kilometers. Our final is the radius of the neutron star after it collapses, which is about 20 kilometers. Now, what we don't exactly have in the right form yet is omega initial. So let's do a little work for that. So this would be the rotational speed of the initial star. which again would be the angle it rotates through delta theta by divided by the time it takes to rotate through that angle. Okay, so what we know is um, that the speed of the rotation initially is about one revolution every month. So this is going to be kind of a rough calculation. When you say a month, that's, you know, are we talking about February or September? Again, it's just a rough calculation. Let's say a month is just 30 days. Okay, we don't have to be too precise. So we cancel out months. Okay, well, every day is 24 hours. Every hour is 60 minutes. And every minute is 60 seconds. So let's do the cancellation. Days, hours, minutes all cancel. And what we're left with is 
units of revolutions per second. That's the unit we want in our final answer. So let's just uh, leave it in that unit. So what you get is 3.86, 10 to the minus seven revolutions per second initially. But the final speed of rotation, as we said earlier, is gonna be given by this formula. We have our initial over our final, which is 10 to the six kilometers over just 20 kilometers. And then we square that, cancel out the units. And then we multiply by omega initial, which is 3.86, uh, 10 to the minus seven revolutions per second. And if you calculate that, you're gonna get something like 967 revolutions per second, which is about a thousand. This is a very rough calculation. So let's just say about a thousand revolutions per second. Okay, now that is an absolutely insane speed of rotation. Really think about this. So the final neutron star is a relatively big object from uh, a human perspective, right? I mean, the radius is about 20 kilometers. So, you know, something a little bit bigger than the size of the city of Rancho Cucamonga, right? That object is spinning 1,000 times around every second, okay? That's what is going on with the neutron star. Okay, so the scenario that we outlined in the previous example might seem a little bit outlandish because we're talking about an object that has a size of about 20 kilometers or so that's spinning a thousand times every second. Um, it's natural to wonder, do those types of objects actually exist? And surprisingly, yes, these types of things actually exist and they've been observed before. So let me tell you about how we know these objects actually exist. So a neutron star is the result of a dying star collapsing in on itself. A pulsar is a special type of neutron star that emits beams of radiation out of its magnetic poles. So just like the Earth has a North Pole and a South Pole for its magnetic field, um, certain types of neutron stars also have those and they emit really intense radiation out of those two poles. So this is a beam of radiation coming out of the North Pole. This is a beam of radiation coming out of the South Pole. Now, the interesting thing about these beams of radiation is they're not always aligned with the axis of rotation. So in other words, the beams of radiation can be coming out this way while the neutron star is rotating about this axis and they don't have to be aligned with each other. So what does this actually look like if we look at a pulsar using our telescope? Well, if we're lucky enough to be in the line of that beam of radiation, so it actually passes in front of us, every time the neutron star rotates, we're gonna see a flash of light, again, where the beam of radiation passes uh, by the Earth. And how frequently that flash of light happens tells us something about how fast the neutron star is rotating. And so what we're looking for, if we're trying to find actual neutron stars out there, is for these flashes of light to happen at a very, very rapid rate, um, indicating that we have a neutron star rotating at a very rapid rate. Now, a bunch of these have been discovered, as it turns out. There are like thousands of uh, pulsars that are already known and probably a lot more out there to be discovered. And again, they're seen to rotate with frequencies up to about a thousand revolutions per second, but on the low side, about 10 revolutions per second, which again is an absolutely insane speed of rotation considering the size of these objects. So yes, these things do exist and we've observed them. We know they're out there. Okay, so let's do a follow-up to that previous example. So in the previous example, the star had a mass of 10 to the 31 kilograms. It initially had a radius of 10 to the six kilometers, and it initially had an angular speed of about one revolution per month. After it collapsed in on itself to become a neutron star, 
Its radius became about 20 kilometers and the angular speed about 1,000 revolutions per second. So what we're going to do here is calculate the rotational kinetic energy of the initial star, and then we're going to calculate the rotational kinetic energy of the final neutron star. So what's the rotational kinetic energy here, and then what's the rotational kinetic energy here? Remember the formula for the rotational kinetic energy is one half times I omega squared. And remember, in order for this to work, the angles must be given in radians. So as before, we're gonna assume the mass remains the same throughout the collapse. And if we find there's a difference in the initial and final kinetic energy, what do you think accounts for that? What accounts for the difference? So pause the video. See if you can make these calculations, and then we'll go through it together. Okay, so here what we have is rotational kinetic energy, which is in general given by one half I omega squared, as we said earlier. But in this case, the object has a spherical shape. A solid sphere has a moment of inertia, two-fifths mR squared uh, if it's rotating about its center. So we'll plug in that formula for I. So we have a half times two-fifths mR squared times omega squared for kinetic energy. Now this simplifies to just one-fifth. So one over five times m times r squared times omega squared. And what we can do is calculate this for the initial state where we have our initial equals 10 to the six kilometers, which by the way is the same as 10 to the six times 10 to the three meters, or just 10 to the nine meters. So the initial radius is about a billion meters, 10 to the nine meters. Also omega initial, as we previously calculated, it's about 3.86, 10 to the minus 7. Uh, that's in revolutions per second. We want to convert that to radians per second. So in every one revolution, we have 2 pi radians. So just take the previous result times 2 pi. That's 2.43, 10 to the minus 6 radians per second. Okay. So the initial rotational kinetic energy is one over five times the mass, which is 10 to the 31 kilograms times R squared, which is 10 to the nine meters squared times omega squared, which is 2.43, 10 to the minus six radians per second. And we square that. Remember, we need this to be in units of radians. Uh, for this formula to come out properly. Okay, so what we have numerically is 1.18, 10 to the 37. And then unit-wise, what we have is kilograms, meters squared on top, seconds squared on the bottom, which is the same as joules. And so to round this uh, to just one sig fig, we have 10 to the 37 joules. So that's the initial kinetic energy of this rotating star. Now, in the final state, so the radius is now our final equals 20 kilometers or 20 times 10 to the three meters. The final speed of the rotation, omega final, as we said earlier, was about 967 uh, revolutions per second, which if we multiply this by 2 pi revolutions per every radian, or sorry, what am I saying? <laughs> 2 pi radians per every uh, one revolution is what I should have said. Again, cancel out revolutions. Now we have radians per second. Okay, so that is about 6,079 radians per second. So now we can calculate the final rotational kinetic energy. It's one fifth times the mass, which is 10 to the 31 
times the radius squared. So we have 20 times 10 to the three meters squared, and then times omega, which is uh, 6,079 radians per second, square that as well. So this comes out to something much bigger than what we had before. This is about 2.96, 10 to the 46. Again, we have kilograms, meters squared per second squared, which if we round it, is about three times 10 to the 46 joules. So the kinetic energy has increased by a lot. The kinetic energy is about 3 billion times greater. So how did that happen? Where did this kinetic energy come from? Well, the star um, lost a lot of potential energy, of gravitational potential energy, as it collapsed. So that's the answer. That's where the extra kinetic energy came from. As the star collapses in on itself, it loses a whole lot of gravitational potential energy. Energy has to be conserved. So where does that energy go? It goes to kinetic energy, i.e. to make the star spin with more kinetic energy than it had before. That's the idea behind this one. Okay, so let's do another example of conservation of angular momentum. So here we have a bullet whose mass is little m, 50 grams. It's shot through a rod, which has a mass of 1.50 kilograms, that's gonna be big M, and a length L is equal to 75 centimeters. And that rod is free to pivot about its center of mass without any friction. So you can imagine it's attached to some kind of axle where it can pivot and rotate without any friction. The bullet strikes the rod, 25 centimeters above the pivot point, so that's the distance here. And the bullet enters the rod with a speed of, uh, sorry, 250 meters per second, but it exits the rod at 150 meters per second. It is, in other words, shot straight through the rod, but it's slowed down in the process. The question is, what is the rotational speed of the rod after the bullet exits? So the rod is initially not rotating, but we can imagine that after the bullet goes through, um, it is going to be rotating at some rate after the fact. So what is that speed of rotation in revolutions per minute or RPM? In order to do this calculation, we're gonna to need to know the moment of inertia of a rod rotated about its center of mass. And that's the formula I is equal to 1 12th ML squared. Okay, so let's work this out. Okay, so for this problem, Let's consider the system to be the bullet plus the rod. So for the system, we have no external torques acting, which means the total angular momentum is conserved. Okay, so what is the total angular momentum? That would be the angular momentum of the bullet plus the angular momentum of the rod. Okay, now when it comes to the rod, this is a solid object which is rotating about a symmetry axis So we know we can use the formula I times omega for this one. When it comes to the bullet, um, let's think of the, bullets, uh, the bullet as a point mass, which is just moving in a straight line. Okay, so in this case, we can use R cross P to calculate the angular momentum. All right, so let's do that. We have L initial is equal to L final, 
what kind of equation do we get from that? Well, what's the initial angular momentum of the bullet? So one way we can express this from the previous video is the mass of the bullet times the speed, which I'm going to call V initial. So V initial is this speed up here, times D, which is the distance of closest approach um, to the axis of rotation, which is here. So that distance D is the 25 centimeter distance that we're given. If we want to get the direction right, uh, using the right-hand rule, R cross P, uh, this is going to end up being into the page. So if we use this coordinate system where X and Y are in the plane of the page and the positive Z direction is coming out of the page, let's just work it out real quick. This is the R vector. And then this is the P vector. Um, in the direction that the bullet is moving in. So if you point the fingers of your right hand in the direction of R, and then you curl those fingers in the direction of P, you're gonna find that L is into the page. Your thumb is gonna end up pointing into the page. So that gets a negative sign. All right. So it's in the minus C direction into the page. Um, on the other hand, the rod initially has no angular momentum it starts at rest. So that's going to be zero. Okay, what about the final? Well, in the final state, the bullet has an angular momentum given by the same formula, minus mv final times d, uh, in the minus c direction. So there's a k hat unit vector there. Uh, but again, the only thing that's changed is the speed. So now the speed is V final, which up here is 150 meters per second. Okay, now the, the rod is going to be rotating in the final state. And it's going to be rotating this way. Which, if we use the right hand rule, and you curl your fingers in the direction of that rotation, which is uh, clockwise you're gonna see that your thumb is pointing into the page in the minus Z direction. So this also gets a minus sign. And then we have I times omega final K hat. Okay, so that's how we write down the equation that says the total angular momentum of the system is conserved. So of course we can simplify this a bit. There's a minus sign and a K hat on every single term. So we can write this as M little m times v initial times d equals little m times v final times d plus i times omega final, where, by the way, the moment of inertia is given by 1 over 12 times big M, that's the mass of the rod, times L squared. So sub that in. So 1 over 12, big M times L squared, omega final. We're trying to solve for omega final. So how about we start by um, subtracting MV final D from both sides. And we can combine these two terms to say that we have M times D times V initial minus V final on the left-hand side, and on the right-hand side, we'll have one over 12 times uh, big M times L squared times omega final. Okay, so to solve for omega final, we'll just multiply through by 12. So on top, we'll have 12 times little m times d, uh, v initial minus v final, divided by M big M times L squared, like that. Okay, so now we just need to put in the numbers. We have 12, uh, little m on top is the mass of the bullet, which is 50 grams, or 50 times 10 to the minus three kilograms. D is 0.25 meters, or 25 centimeters. The initial, 250 meters per second, minus the final, 150 
meters per second, and then we divide out. Big M, which is 1.5 kilograms times L squared. L is 75 centimeters or 0.75 meters. We square that. Okay. Now, this is going to come out in radians per second. So we have 17.78, keeping two sig figs, radians per second. Now, the last step is simply to convert that to RPM. So RPM is revolutions per minute. So first, we'll convert from radians to revolutions because in every one revolution, we have two pi radians. We can do that conversion. And we, got, we want to go also from seconds to minutes. So we have 60 seconds in every one minute. So cancel out seconds. This works out to 169.8. We have revolutions on top, minutes on the bottom after doing the unit cancellation, but we're also keeping two sig figs, just like before. So this rounds to about 170 RPM. So that's how fast the rod is rotating after the bullet is shot through it, 170 RPM. Okay, so here's a follow-up question to the one we just did. Let's say the bullet had entered the rod with the same speed as we had previously, so it comes in at 250 meters per second, but it exits at a larger speed than before. So maybe it exits at uh, 245 meters per second. So is the resulting rotational speed of the rod going to be greater or less than what we found previously? So think about this, pause the video, see if you can get the answer and then we'll go through it together. Okay, so one way we can think about this is just to use the formula that we got at the end of the uh, previous problem before we plugged in the numbers, which is omega final is equal to 12 times little m times d times v initial minus v final over big M times L squared. Now, the only thing that's changed here is V final. V final is bigger than it was before. So if we just look at the formula, V initial minus V final, the difference between the initial and the final speed is less than before. And that immediately implies that omega final is also going to be less than before. So the rod rotates slower than before. There's another way of looking at this, um, which is if um, angular momentum is conserved, okay, that means that the total angular momentum, which is Again, the angular momentum of the bullet plus the angular momentum of the rod is something that is not changing. So delta L, the change in the total angular momentum, is equal to zero, which is to say that delta L for the bullet, the change in angular momentum of the bullet, plus delta L for the rod, the change in angular momentum of the rod has to equal zero because overall there is no change. Okay, well, that means delta L for the rod is equal to minus delta L for the bullet. So to put that in words, any angular momentum Uh, lost by the bullet is gained by the rod because overall the total has to remain the same. So in this case, we have less angular momentum lost by the bullet compared to previously 
So what's that going to imply? Less angular momentum gained by the rod than before. Which is just another way of saying it's rotating slower than before. Okay, so that's how you think about this one. Okay, so the last topic that I wanted to cover here is something called gyroscopic stability. And the concept that I'm trying to get across is if an object is spinning, it can be made stable. It's more stable because of the fact that it's spinning. So to be a little bit more specific, the faster an object is rotating, of course, the more angular momentum it's going to have. So as a result of that, as we'll show, the harder it will be to reorient the axis of rotation. In other words, the faster something is rotating, the harder it will be to tip it over and reorient the axis of rotation. So therefore, it's more stable. So let's consider this cone. That will be our object. And let's say it's rotating about the z-axis. And let's say someone comes along and pushes the rotating cone in the x direction like this. So, so there's a force acting in the positive x direction on the cone. Well, we know that the torque is equal to R cross F. So this force that we apply to the cone is also going to result in a torque. So what's the F vector? Well, that's just the force here. The R vector goes from the origin here to this point where the force is being applied. So if you do R cross F using the right hand rule, you're gonna get a torque going in the positive Y direction like this. So this is the direction of the resulting torque. Okay, now the next step we can take is to use the result we derived earlier that says the net external torque acting on a system is equal to dl dt, that's the derivative of angular momentum with respect to time. Now in this case, there's only one torque it's the one we're labeling here as tau. So we can rearrange the equation, just put the dt over on that side, and now it says dl is equal to tau times dt. So this is a tiny little change in angular momentum. It's equal to the torque that we apply times a little bit of time that passes. That's what this is telling us. Okay, well, the torque is causing a change in angular momentum, right? If we take our initial angular momentum, which I'll call L naught, and then we add DL, we add that little bit of change. When we add those together, we're gonna to get the final angular momentum. So that's how you should read this equation. The final angular momentum is equal to the initial plus this little bit of change, okay? All right, so what we're doing is we're adding two vectors here. L naught and DL are both vectors. L naught is pointing along the z-axis because that's the axis we're rotating around. But DL is pointing in the direction of this torque, around, uh, in other words, along the y-axis. So if I wanna show L naught being added to DL, I need to have DL pointing to the right along the y-axis. And of course, since we're adding these two vectors, we do it tip to tail like this, and then we get the resultant vector which is L. So the idea is L naught, the initial angular momentum was pointing straight up along the z-axis, but now we've kind of tipped that so it's pointing a little bit to the right. So in other words, we've reoriented the object so it's tipped this way. Now, if we wanna know how much we've tipped the object, we could give an angle, like maybe I deflected the cone by five degrees or something like that, right? So how could we solve for that angle? Well, basically, um, it's going to be using the tangent function because tangent of this angle is the opposite side, which is tau times dt, divided by the adjacent side, which is L0. So the amount which we tip the cone as a result of pushing it like this is given by tangent theta is equal to tau times dt divided by L0. Now, the important thing to see here is that L naught is in the denominator. 
that means the bigger L naught is, the smaller theta is going to be. In other words, the more angular momentum our spinning object has, the less it's going to be deflected as a result of pushing it. So a larger amount of angular momentum means it's going to tip over less. That's another way of saying it's more stable. It doesn't like to be reoriented from its initial position. So that's the mathematics behind gyroscopic stability. But again, the concept is that gyroscopic stability is the resistance of a rotating object to having its axis of rotation reoriented. So that means the faster it spins, the more stable that object is going to be in whatever orientation it's currently in. The harder it's going to be to reorient it to some new position. So this is used in all kinds of technology. We have spinning gyroscopes that are used to stabilize different pieces of equipment and make sure they don't uh, get reoriented as things move around. So to give you a few examples, we have space telescopes like the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, as it captures an image of a distant star or something like that, it needs to be kept very stable. Uh, so on board that telescope, you'll have gyroscopes to ensure stability. Uh, we have movie cameras that are stabilized with gyroscopes and e even things like navigation equipment on board uh, ships and boats. Again, in order to keep them stable, we have gyroscopes. So I'll show you a couple different videos here uh, and you can click the link on the bottom to uh, see where those videos come from. But in the first one, we have gyroscopes on board this cube. And again, even if we sort of lift up the uh, surface that the cube is on, it still manages to balance on that tip, uh, which would be very hard to do if we didn't have gyroscopes on board to keep it stable. Um, another example of this, again, is in a gyroscopically stabilized camera, which you're seeing here. So again, the onboard gyroscopes make it very difficult to sort of reorient the way that camera is facing. Okay, so we can use rotation, we can use rotating objects to keep things more stable. That's the idea. Okay, so there are a couple demonstrations that I'd like to show you involving this bicycle wheel. And the first one is about gyroscopic stability. So let's say I take the wheel and it's not rotating, and I just sort of tip it over back and forth like this just to get a sense of how difficult that feels. Now, I'm gonna get the wheel rotating and do the same thing. It's a lot more difficult, it's quite, it requires a lot more effort on my part to tip the wheel now. And again, that just shows the idea of gyroscopic stability. When the wheel is rotating, it's much more difficult to reorient it. It's much more resistant to being reoriented. Okay. Another demo that I'd like to show you involves this stool here. So this is a stool that can rotate. And what I'm going to do is sit down on the stool with my feet up so I'm free to rotate. And while I'm on the stool, I'm going to get this bicycle wheel rotating and I'm going to hold it like this. So here we go. Okay, so now I'm up on the stool. Now I'm going to tip the wheel over. Okay, now I'm going to tip it back. So that's pretty interesting, right? When I flipped the wheel over, I started rotating on the stool. Why is that? Well, it's really all about conservation of angular momentum. Remember, the angular momentum of the wheel can be given by the right-hand rule, or the direction can be given by the right-hand rule. So if I spin the wheel this way, if I curl the fingers of my right hand in the direction of that rotation, my thumb is pointing up. So the angular momentum right now is up for the wheel. But if I tip it over, now the angular momentum is pointing down. But the total angular momentum of myself and the wheel has to be conserved. So if I flip the wheel over so now its angular momentum is downwards, that's, that's going to have to be compensated for by me picking up some angular momentum, which is pointing upwards, meaning I'm going to rotate this way. And that's exactly what you saw happen. 
the reason I started rotating is just a consequence of conservation of angular momentum. So related to that is the idea of gyroscopic precession. So let me introduce this to you by showing you a video so you can get a sense of what this looks like. Now, this is a video of a really common physics demo where we have a string which is hanging vertically. From the bottom end of the string, we attach an axle, and this axle goes through a wheel. Now, we would know what would happen if the wheel were not rotating. As soon as this guy lets go of the wheel, if it's not rotating, it's just gonna flop down and hang vertically, right? On the other hand, if it is rotating, something kind of unexpected happens. So rather than flopping down, the rotating wheel is processing. In other words, it's moving around in a circle. So this is an example of what we call gyroscopic precession, which is when the axis of rotation of the object is itself rotating. That's what's happening here. You see the axis is rotating around in a circle and that's due to an external torque. There's some kind of outside torque that's causing this to happen. In this case, it's from gravity and usually it's gonna be because of gravity. Okay, if you wanna see this again and uh, learn more about gyroscopic precession, there's a really cool video that I left a link to right here. Okay, so next we're gonna derive an equation that describes how quickly gyroscopic precession happens. So here's the setup. We have some kind of spinning object. It's spinning on its own axis at a rate which we call lowercase omega. This is lowercase omega. And again, that represents the angular speed of the object as it rotates on its own axis. That's lowercase omega. As a result of that rotation, the object has some kind of angular momentum. So the angular momentum vector of the object is pointing along the axis like this. That's L. And because it's processing, that L vector is actually tracing out a circle. That's what it means to process. It's not just oriented this way the whole time. It's uh, tracing out a circle in terms of the L vector. Now, what we want to know is how fast is it processing? In other words, how many radians per second are we tracing out? Uh, that's going to be called the frequency of the gyroscopic precession. Okay? We're going to use capital omega for that. That's the frequency of the precession rather than how fast the object is spinning on its axis, which is lowercase omega. So there are a few other variables that are going to go into this. We have capital M, that's the mass of the object. G is, of course, the acceleration due to gravity. And then D is the distance between the pivot point and the center of mass of the object. That's D right there. And then I is the moment of inertia of the object. So what we're going to show is that the frequency of the gyroscopic precession, capital Omega, is given by M times G times D divided by I times Omega. That's the result we're going to prove. Okay, so in order to do this derivation, we're going to be using the result that we derived in the last video, which is the net external torque acting on a system is dl dt, uh, which is the derivative of angular momentum with respect to time. Now, in this case, the only external torque that we have to worry about is due to gravity. So let me show you what that looks like. The force of gravity acting on this object points straight down and it acts right at the center of mass. So there's the force of gravity acting at the center of mass. But torque is given by, of course, R cross F. So if we take the point down here, where there's contact with the ground to be our pivot point, then the R vector is gonna go from that pivot point to the center of mass, which is where the force of gravity acts. And then we can note that there will be some angle between these two vectors. Let's just call it theta for now. Okay, so this torque is going to have a direction, which is given by the right-hand rule. 
So if we do R cross F using the right hand rule, we're gonna find that the torque is pointing out of the page like this. So the torque is basically horizontal or out of the page from our perspective. Okay, as for the magnitude of that torque, well, the magnitude of any torque is given by the magnitude of R, the magnitude of F times sine of the angle between them, where in this case, the magnitude of R is just D, the distance between the pivot point and the axis of rotation. The magnitude of the force is M times G, and then we have sine theta just like before. In other words, MGD sine theta is the magnitude of that torque due to gravity. Okay, now there's something else we can add to the diagram here. So we have the L vector pointing at some angle. Uh, we can actually break that vector L into components. So we're gonna have a vertical component here and a horizontal component here. And notice that the same angle theta appears in the triangle right there. So if we take a closer look at this triangle and remember the fact that sine of theta is equal to the opposite side over the hypotenuse in a right triangle, in this case, the opposite side is um, L horizontal. The hypotenuse is just the magnitude of L. So therefore, L horizontal, in case we want to know what that is for later, is equal to the magnitude of L times sine theta, or I times omega times sine theta, because again, the um, magnitude of the angular momentum L is going to be given by I times omega. Okay, so the next thing we'll do is if we have the torque due to gravity equals dl dt, then we can rearrange that to say that dl is equal to the torque times dt. Pretty straightforward, right? So let's take a look at this situation from a different perspective. Okay, so let's say we're looking from the top down at this spinning object. What, what does the top-down view sort of look like? Okay, well, first, we're going to see that the horizontal piece of the angular momentum is pointing this way. But our change in angular momentum, dl, is going to be pointing perpendicular to that. Okay, because remember, the torque... Um, times dt gives you dl, so the direction of the torque is shown like this. Now, to be clear, that first vector I drew would be just the initial L horizontal, but after we add this dl to it, now we have the final L horizontal, because the angular momentum, of course, is changing as the object is processing around. So let's call the angle here between these two um, L horizontal vectors. Let's call this D phi. So it's a little bit of angle that we process through. And of course, we can show the whole circle here. This is just a little piece of it. Over time, we're gonna process around in the circle as shown here. But D phi shows you just a little bit of angle that we rotate through. Okay, so that angle d phi, as long as we measure it in radians, is equal to an arc length over a radius. That's really the definition of um, an angle in radians. It's an arc length over a radius. Well, in this case, the arc length would be this guy right here, dl. The magnitude of dl would be the little bit of arc along the circle that we go um, across from the angle d phi. 
whereas the radius would be the magnitude of L horizontal. That would be the radius of that circle we drew. Well, um, we have then d phi is equal to um, the magnitude of the torque times dt, because that's dl, over the magnitude of L horizontal, which gives us d phi is equal to, okay, the magnitude of the torque, as we said up here, is equal to mgd sine theta using this result, but that multiplies dt now. The magnitude of L horizontal, which we found over here, is I times omega times sine of theta. So let's cancel out sine of theta. And also let's take dt and divide it out on both sides. So we have d phi dt is equal to mgd over I times omega. That's really the result we're trying to prove. Because phi, or sorry, um, this is a capital omega. That's what this is. That would be the angle we process through per unit of time. Okay, in other words, that would be d phi dt, which would be equal to mgd over i times omega. So this is the frequency of precession. Okay, that's where that comes from. Okay, so let's do an example problem where we get to put the formula that we just derived to use. So here we have a gyroscope which consists of a disc that has a radius of 7.50 centimeters. So this is the disc. And it's free to rotate without any friction. Assume that the frame that holds the disc in place and the axle that the disc rotates on have negligible mass. So the frame here and the axle that is connected to the disc, we're just going to ignore their mass. We're gonna assume that only the disc has any appreciable amount of mass. Okay, the distance between the point of contact with the ground here and the disc's center of mass here is 10.5 centimeters. If the disc rotates at 197 radians per second, that's how fast it's spinning, what is the frequency of the precession of the gyroscope? So that would be how fast the gyroscope is processing like this. Um, and as a follow-up, how long would it take for the gyroscope to process in a, full in a full circle? So how much time would that take in seconds? Okay, so you're gonna need to know the moment of inertia of a solid cylinder, a solid disc rotating about its center of mass. That's given by 1 half m r squared. And you're also gonna need to know the formula we just derived previously. Put those together. See if you can make these calculations and then come back to the video when you think you have your answers. Okay, so this one is a pretty straightforward plug and chug kind of problem. The frequency of precession, as we found, is given by capital Omega, which is MGD divided by I times lowercase Omega. And in this case, for I, for the moment of inertia, we're talking about a spinning disk. So we have one half M times R squared. And that multiplies lowercase omega on the bottom, but notice how the mass actually drops out. And then the factor of two goes to the top. So we have two times GD divided by R squared times little omega. And at this point, we can just plug in everything we know because we have two times g, which is 9.8 meters per second squared. Now d, in this case, was 10.5 centimeters or 0 0.105 meters. That's the distance from the pivot point to the center of mass of the disk. We divide that by r squared, the radius of the disk squared. That was 7.5 centimeters or 
0.75 meters, square that. And then little omega is how fast the disk is spinning on its own axis, which is 197 radians per second. So if you crunch these numbers, the frequency of precession is 1.857 radians per second. We're actually going to keep three sig figs on that, so 1.86 radians per second. That's how fast it's processing. It's a lot slower than how fast the disk is rotating. Now, if we remember what capital omega actually represents, again, it's the angle uh, of precession. So how much do we process in terms of an angle divided by time? So what if we make the angle two pi? That means we've processed around in a circle one full time, okay? Then the time would actually be what we call the period, capital T. So the point is, the time we're interested in, the time to process in a circle, in one full circle, that time is gonna be given by two pi over capital omega. So we have 2 pi divided by 1.857 radians per second, which gives us an answer in seconds, 3.383 seconds, or about 3.38 seconds when we round it to the right number of sig figs. So it actually takes quite a while for the gyroscope to actually process in a circle one time. It's doing that actually pretty slowly. Anyway, that's how you make this calculation. Okay, so I thought that I'd also show you a quick demo of a gyroscope. So this gyroscope consists of a disc that is free to rotate about the axle, which goes along this direction. And the disc is inside of this frame. Now I can put the gyroscope onto a stand like this. And right now, the disc is not rotating, so it's very hard to balance the gyroscope on the stand. In other words, it's very unstable. It will easily topple over. But let's see what happens if I get the gyroscope spinning first and then put it on the stand. There are a few things that I want you to notice when I do this. First, it's a lot more stable. So the rotation makes it more stable and makes it harder for the gyroscope to topple over. Also, notice that the gyroscope is going to process, okay? So in other words, the axis of rotation of the gyroscope is going to be tracing out a circle like this. That's what we call precession. One other thing to notice about that, how fast the gyroscope processes, the frequency of the precession, is actually inversely related to the frequency of the spinning of this disc. So the faster this disc is spinning, the slower it's going to process, all right? So keep all those things in mind, and let's see what happens again when I get the gyroscope going and put it on the stand. Okay. So there it is. It's very stable. I can even try to knock it a little bit, and it's really not reorienting itself that much. So it's very stable in its orientation, but you see the procession happening now. And notice how over time, the procession is happening faster and faster. Okay, that's because the rotation of the disc is slowing down due to friction. So as the rotation of the disc slows down, it processes faster and faster. That's what we're seeing here. Okay, so one really interesting application of this idea of procession is found in astronomy. It turns out the Earth is actually processing um, much like the gyroscope that we saw in the previous example, it's just processing a lot more slowly. So let me explain what this sort of looks like. Um, so the Earth's axis of rotation is actually tilted relative to the plane of its orbit around the sun. What that means is this. So here's the Earth, here's the sun, and as the Earth orbits the sun, it moves in this path shown here, 
And that path defines what we call the orbital plane. As the Earth is orbiting the sun, it stays in a certain plane. That's called the orbital plane. Now, at the same time, the Earth is rotating on its axis, and the axis of rotation of the Earth is tilted relative to that orbital plane by 23.5 degrees, okay? So the Earth's axis of rotation doesn't just stay in this one position, okay? It doesn't just stay fixed in this one orientation. Instead, it slowly processes, okay? And it processes very, very slowly. The period is about 26,000 years. So it takes about 26,000 years for Earth's axis of rotation to process around one full time. Now, why is it doing that? Why is it processing? As we saw earlier, it takes some kind of torque to make a spinning object process. In this case, there are small torques exerted by the sun and the moon and other planets that cause the Earth's axis of rotation to process. So if we take a look at what that looks like in an animation, it's something like this. So this line is the axis of rotation of the Earth. That's the line that the Earth uh, spins around. But again, that axis is processing as shown here. And it takes about 26,000 years for one full period of procession. So it happens very, very slowly. Okay, that's really it for this lecture. Um, that's all I wanted to cover as far as angular momentum is concerned. As usual, there are a bunch of practice problems at the end of this lecture. You can check these out, try them out on your own time for extra practice, especially as you're studying for the test. These are useful. Um, you can find the solutions to these problems on Canvas. So that's it for this video. I'll see you in the next one. Until then, take care. Be safe out there. See you later.